And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our leader um, and captain of the ship, um, uh, Jeremy, um, Jeremy Watson. Um, I think you will all have notes on Jeremy, but Jeremy's been leading us on this seven-year journey on Petrus, the National Centre of Excellence. Um, and we've had an enormous team of universities working together, of industry um, partners, of companies spinning out. And um, so it's been a great pleasure working with Jeremy, and I'd like to ask Jeremy to come to the stage. Thank you. So firstly, thank you. Well, can we perhaps turn the volume down slightly here? Um, to Rachel for your very kind words there. So um, as she said, I've had the pleasure and the privilege of directing Petras for getting on for eight years now, actually. It's over seven years. And this really is our first inverted commas public event. Uh, and I'm delighted that so many delegates, panelists, and exhibitors were able to come. Uh, we're keen to give you a flavor of the work we've done, essentially, that's, and the work of our partners as well. And we want to encourage you to be collaborative. So we're really keen on understanding what your interests and needs are and how, you might, how we might work together to solve some of those. We've included in our exhibitors some of the demonstrator work that came out from the Securing Digital Technologies at the Periphery Programme with Innovate UK, and also Cyber ASAP, uh, which is now DSIT funded, but also had a stream of Petras money to support it, which is all about startups out of ac academic research uh, going forward into, into companies. So Petras stands for Privacy, Ethics, Trustworthiness, Reliability, and Ethics. And that was kind of the, the kind of mission statement, if you like, at the beginning. And I have to give credit to Michael Huth of Imperial College, who came up with it. Um, and it's really stood us in very good stead, I think, over, over the period. It's a research collaboration dealing with technologies at the edge of the internet, not just IoT. We extended it from that. Um, and it works across social and physical science disciplines, which is really important because we need to co-create to understand how people use technology and how to protect them. Uh, it's led by UCL with four major universities, so uh, Imperial, Oxford, Warwick initially, um, Warwick and now Loughborough and Lancaster, and they're represented by the quintet here today. I think I covered all five then, didn't I? Making sure of that. Um, and we brought in then further universities. We now have a community of 24 collaborating universities over the period, which uh, we feel rather proud of, and we're now in our eighth year. So the theme of today's event is we are connected, but are we protected? Um, and although Petras has looked in detail at some of the issues around operational technology, critical national infrastructure, and water, energy sectors, etc., what we want to do today, and, and with a view perhaps to parliamentarians attending, uh, either now or later, um, is really just to highlight the citizen perception of privacy and, and safety. Um, so m many of our talks will actually be around personal IoT and connectivity. Um, which I think is a, is a new move for us and, and should be really interesting. So, you know, the citizen focus on living in a digitalized world and what are the benefits and risks that it brings. Hopefully things move on. Oh, okay, that's the one I want. <laughs> so some prov provocations, I guess. Our personal environment, what we carry, what we have at home, is full of devices that sense, compute, and communicate our patterns of life. So whether they're simple as a store loyalty card, which is probably the minimum, if you like, very much cloud connected when we buy something from our supermarket, or as complex as a smartphone, the traces of our life, our lives, are recorded and very often shared with third parties. And much of this sharing benefits us, let's be frank, and we, we would miss it if it wasn't there, um, but a lot goes on without our knowledge or permission. And I think that's something that really surprised me when I worked a little bit more in this area. Um, just a little bit of background, as part of uh, my professional life, I worked as chief scientist at the building research establishment, and we did analysis of IoT devices in the home in depth. And we were surprised at where some of the packets went from those IoT devices to marketing companies, and causes one to think, actually, did anyone give permission for that to happen? Um, the security of our personal environment is also important, and we want to be safe against fraud, misuse of personal information, cyber attacks, of course. Device providers vary in the quality of the protection they provide. Um, and we're aware that sort of app updates on our smartphones are typically well managed from secure sites and trustworthy. 
but uh, device makers who uh, supply, say, IoT devices from either small or large companies have variable quality, if you like, in support. And, and obviously, we're also concerned about orphaned devices which no longer have a support company becoming hacked. And of course, some of the risks involved in that are denial of service attacks where, for example, a number of IoT devices can be recruited to attack a, a site without you even knowing it. They're all connected via your router, um, so they have access to the broader internet, etc. Simple cyber hygiene, as people call it, and cyber awareness can help keep us safe. And advice from the National Cyber Security Centre is really helpful in learning these basic measures. And you can go online and look at that, as many of you will know. Regulatory and policy measures are important as well. Uh, GDPR, the EU's DSA and AI Acts are allowing citizens to adjust and delete uh, data that's held. Or I prefer to use the word information rather than data because it's data in context that's really important. Um, but researchers within Petras have, uh, have argued that actually the amount of protection that's offered through those measures is, is limited, if you like. People need to know about them, they need to know their rights, they need to exercise their rights. So I'm going to just talk very briefly about Petras. So we began in response to a call for research in the government's 2014 Blackett Review on the Internet of Things, which is, as you probably know, a commissioned review that government chief scientific advisors uh, commissioned from time to time. At that time, the Internet of Things was seen to be a bit of an unknown, so some work was done on the benefits and potential disbenefits of, of IoT. In fact, uh, Cameron um, was a prime minister at the time, wrote the forward for it, and it was all about it releasing economic potential of edge devices, essentially. So we started as a collaborative fund, a uh, hub of five universities, and developed a network of six more initially, completed 60 initial research projects over three years, spanning social and technical themes, and then after three years, we were evaluated by EPSRC through an independent consultancy and put forward to be funded by the Strategic Priorities Fund, which UKRI started, as UK Research and Innovation started out with. And we were very proud to uh, receive that award under a closed call. We had a very rigorous interview process to get it, but it was uh, a closed call. And we were given then the um, authority to issue further grants, sub-grants under transparent governance uh, to other universities. And that's how we brought in uh, our full community. So we've ended up now, as I mentioned, with 24 universities as Petras members and 150 user partners, many of whom hopefully are here today. So people who are both in, in government, in the government agencies, in small and large companies who've worked with us, co-created those projects and worked with us on the research in many cases as well and helped take us closer to real impact in, in, in the world. Um, so the stats are really all on the screen here, but 350 publications, We've had some really excellent work on knowledge management uh, from our synthesis fellow team, uh, all who, of whom are here today. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I close. And um, we've informed government policy in uh, departments of transport and science, innovation and technology um, in the information commissioner's office who commissioned us to write papers for them. Uh, and as I say, more stats are on the slide. So one of the innovations in the process of how we have done our work, particularly recently, is to bring in uh, a number of three, in fact, synthesis fellows whose work as a senior research fellow is to span the disciplines and look across them and to extract some generic features which might inform, for example, policy or practice. And so we have here uh, today um, Peter Levitsky, who's come from the Netherlands, uh, where he works, uh, to uh, help us, and he's, he's been really contributory. Gideon Nagunwe, who's worked very closely with Rajab Said, Dr. Said, who's been very close to industry and making uh, those uh, links. And Octay Satinkaya, who's based in Oxford. Am I looking around? <laughs> OK, yeah, who uh, is a technology background and is working uh, with us very closely on semiconductor strategy. So I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to uh, just hope that you find the talks and discussions today informative and stimulating. Uh, the aim is, you now what is the outcome we're aiming for here? Well, it's broadening the discussion, really, uh, engaging further, and talking about transparency, about information use, and the agency that citizen users should have in controlling the privacy and security of their digital lives. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Professor Sir Anthony Finkelstein, uh, past Chief Scientific Advisor for, for uh, UK Security, and now the Vice-Chancellor of City University. Is that correct? That's perfect. Thank you I'm glad. Much Shall I sit back down? Well, or come, come and sit and... next to okay. we'll... Right, okay. Thank you. So, it, it's going to become uh, 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 obvious, I guess, as this goes on, 
why I'm going to try and do this in a bit of an informal style. Um, you know, normally when you um, give a, a, a keynote talk, um, um, you recover from, you know, the PowerPoint uh, uh, file for the usual shtick. Um, and I, of course, have got several of, um, uh, of those. And it's, you know, it's well practiced and well rehearsed and you're confident of the content um, uh, and, so, uh, and so on. And it, um, um, I've chosen not to do that on this uh, uh, occasion. Um, I think there are sufficient friends in the, uh, in the room for me to take something more of a risk. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, uh, tell you a little bit about the sto a story, a particular story. And it's the story of the NHS contact tracing app. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, it's not a story that's been told um, in public or to a professional audience uh, before, uh, before. So this is my first time of telling this, uh, of telling this story. And I'm going to tell it in narrative style with all the wrinkles that you might expect. And we hope that there'll be scope for you to ask me uh, questions um, uh, and so on and have a bit of a discussion at the end, uh, at the end of, uh, of this. Um, I suddenly thought it'd be worthwhile uh, just doing this. So quick show of hands. Who had the NHS contact tracing app on their phone? OK. So that, uh, um, um, that's pretty much what I would expect, some 70 to 80 percent of, um, um, of, uh, of this audience. Um, so um, before I plunge into this, it's probably worthwhile me voicing some caveats. Um, the first is, I was, a, um, at that stage, uh, a chief scientific advisor for national security. Um, so I was a government servant. Um, and um, I take the principles of government service personally and very seriously, and I'm going to strictly adhere um, uh, uh, to those. So. Um, I'm not going to intrude on political, um, on political issues. You can draw whatever inferences um, um, you, cho um, you choose. I am going to um, uh, um, keep on the tight side of an adherence to confidentiality and to uh, naming uh, and to naming individuals. Um, there is also actually um, a bit of a limitation because when I left government, um, I left all my files and um, uh, and documents um, um, and documents behind. Um, so um, um, you know, diaries the lot, um, and um, uh, so what you're going to get is the. Um, is my rather poor recollections, so they're stronger on color than they are on date, um, and things like that. I want to start with um, one thing, and I, it makes me feel good, so I feel like you know I want to say it, which is um, um, what the um, analysis, as a paper in Nature, I can provide to people says is that um, uh, the contact tracing app saved about uh, 9,500 lives in the UK, um, saved about 44,000 hospitalizations. And that's, um, um, uh, um, that's something I'm very proud of. Um, it's something we can collectively be very proud of. It's something um, um, our collective professions um, uh, can be very uh, can be very proud of. That's a stock of 
human misery avoided, um, um, that we should just uh, recognize. Um, I'm going to start um, a little bit, some stuff that people, so a lot of people have heard of SAGE. Uh, SAGE stands for um, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. And um, SAGE provides advice to, um, uh, uh, to COBRAs, which are the meetings um, held to coordinate emergencies um, uh, in, gov uh, in government. COBRAs are a, a, a cabinet level um, meeting of politicians and associated uh, senior civil senior civil servants. Um, the uh, COBRA stands for um, Cabinet Office Briefing Room A. Uh, it's also a very dramatic um, uh, uh, thing. And if any of you, there probably are some people who've been in um, uh, in COBRA or, or, or COBRAs. <laughs> it's a very bizarre sort of 1970s style um, meeting, um, uh, meeting room. And um, like um, many um, uh, of the, uh, um, uh, like much uh, of UK government, a lot of consequential stuff um, goes on in some settings you would not imagine it. Um, uh, to happen, and no dramatist would set um, um, uh, uh, would set it in that in that setting. Um, um, as an aside, uh, um, <laughs> I met with Dom Cummings. First time I met with Dom Cummings in the um, um, in Downing Street during COVID, um, uh, and um, um, he took me into um, the the room where we could best socially distance, which was the cabinet room itself. Um, uh, and he looked around and said, you know, unchanged since the 18th century. Uh, and he said, and this is where we're making modern decisions. And there was a certain, as for so much of what Dom Cummings said, quite a lot of truth in it. Um, the uh, people fail to understand often that SAGE wasn't a COVID thing. SAGE was a UK emergencies thing. So um, I attended the early COVID SAGEs, um, uh, so the first of the, um, uh, of the COVID SAGEs. The, um, uh, but in fact, this was my third SAGE uh, SAGEs. So I'd done um, uh, um, uh, uh, three active ones and about five um, practice um, sages before, um, uh, before that. I'd done drones over Gatwick um, um, and Salisbury 1 and Salisbury um, uh, 2 um, uh, before, um, uh, before that. Um, SAGE are brilliant for managing emergencies. Um, uh, as a little aside, of course, um, at a certain point, COVID stopped being an emergency and started to be um, something rather different, prolonged crisis. I don't know what, you, what term one would, would use. And actually, there's an open question as to whether the mechanism for managing an emergency and the mechanism for managing a long-running crisis with a whole series of technical and scientific ramifications were the right mechanism. That's not for this, um, uh, um, uh, for this moment. Um, uh, shortly after the, um, uh, um, the first meetings of, um, uh, of those sages. I, I got a call from, um, uh, from Sir Patrick Valance, uh, Patrick, um, uh, and um, he'd been, um, uh, he'd been, two streams of things have come to him. 
The first was that there were some indications that the Chinese were using uh, an app um, uh, based on top of um, one of the large Chinese platform apps, WeChat, um, uh, in order to um, uh, um, uh, provide some, I don't know exactly what the right terminology is, uh, uh, in order to engage with citizens um, uh, on the um, uh, over control round the outbreak of COVID. Um, uh, of COVID. There were some similar indications, details not available, um, that um, uh, uh, Korea um, was on a track to develop um, uh, an app to um, uh, uh, provide control and notifications of their policies of restrictions around, um, uh, uh, around COVID. Um, and then the last thing was that a group at Oxford University, um, led by a brilliant scientist called Christoph Fraser, um, uh, um, who... Um, um, had uh, written to Patrick suggesting that um, uh, uh, an app could be used to identify patterns of contact uh, amongst individuals during the, uh, um, uh, during the COVID crisis. So um, uh, um, uh, Patrick said, could you get together to me, could you get together with the people from NHSX? NHSX was the um, uh, NHS's digital innovation um, arm and work out whether or not um, uh, um, it was possible to develop a, um, uh, a contact tracing, uh, a contact tracing app. Um, and so we met, I think the first time we met was in, um, uh, uh, first meeting was on a Friday um, in uh, Victoria Street, uh, just opposite um, um, the, what was then the Bayes Building, DBT now, um, uh, at Go Science, the Government Office for Science, which was Patrick's office. Um, and um, uh, um, we started to unpick um, the work that had been done. It was quite clear that we didn't have sufficient information on the Chinese um, and Korean experiences, um, and that what information we had appeared to be misreported. Um, but um, we did have some really interesting modeling from the Oxford team, and I'll say a little bit about that uh, in a moment. Um, uh, in a moment. The next day was Saturday, uh, um, uh, but by this stage everybody knew we were in a crisis. Um, and uh, this is always my favourite part of the story. Um, my younger son was staying at our house, at, uh, um, uh, so he was a junior civil servant in the Department for Transport. Um, um, uh, and um, oh, it must have been about. <coughs> 7 a.m., I go into his room and I wake him up and I say to him, uh, um, uh, I don't have anybody to minute this meeting. Um, uh, you know, his usual sort of thing, oh, dad. You know, the, and um, um, uh, so he comes in and um, uh, spends the next uh, uh, month um, working um, are working on this, and I always think it's a story because it, it gives a sense to you maybe of the ad hocery of the whole thing during that process, uh, um, um, uh, during that um, uh, during that moment. So uh, we sit round the table, and um, it, it's fairly clear from the outset. I think it was fairly clear that um, uh, um, what the potential of um, automated contact tracing was likely um, uh, um, uh, was likely to be 
um, uh, um, to be. And um, um, as we looked at the models, it was, became very clear that there was, a, there was a critical uncertainty around two things. That this would only work if we could develop it really quickly whilst um, 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 we were in the lower portion of the, of the spike. Um, and that um, uh, basically every day counted. And it was also very clear that um, um, the uptake was going to be critical. We knew a little bit about the penetration of mobile phones. We knew roughly um, what that We just had no clue whether people would actually uptake. And I have to tell you now, I don't think we had any idea that actually the uptake. So it turns out the uptake was enormous and way out of our reasonable expectations of what that uptake. Uh, or what that uptake, uptake was, um, um, was almost the speed was not. Um, uh, um, but um, we just realized that absolutely critical sensitivity to those, uh, to those things. For, you, for those interested here, just so that you know, and I, uh, honest things, I do not recall at that stage that we ever discussed um, uh, security or privacy. At, 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 at any stage, um, um, we were solely focused on people dying. That was the the the, the sole fo um, uh, the sole focus. Um, other matters of propriety of government process of all of those things were wholly set aside, um, um, and um, we were completely focused on the curve and on what we could do um, um, uh, to mitigate the effects or to flatten the curve. Um, uh, um, or to flatten the curve. And it seemed at that moment, I think you can all probably recollect the psychology of the moment, perhaps not in that same setting, uh, that seemed the dominant, um, uh, um, the dominant concern. Keep me to time. Um, we moved at that stage. We um, 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 we moved over um, uh, to um, uh, to NHS um, X, uh, which is the big NHS building, um, by, um, uh, at uh, in Borough, um, just south of the uh, river near Elephantstone Castle, um, uh, and um, actually. Um, then there were a couple of, we spent maybe three weeks principally based there. Um, I, I, I don't want to extend the story longer than it needs to go on. At that point, um, people started falling ill. And we realized we couldn't operate as a team in the way we had uh, uh, there. And from that point, quite a lot of the stuff was done in a distributed Fashion, but for most of the time there was a there was there remained a physical, a physical hub. Five minutes. We've got with questions. So whether you want to open anyone's burning question from the floor, I've got some. Okay. But let's go to the floor when you're ready. Okay. But I don't want to miss any what key points. So we're supposed to close, I think, at ten forty. But we, we can extend five minutes over. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, um, uh, okay, I'm just going to run through the, the things. At that point, we, um, um, we identified the key concept um, for the realization of this. And um, um, essentially, I, with some others, set out a centralized data architecture for, uh, um, uh, um, uh, by which these contact tracing record, these contact records would be kept. We were fairly confident ab uh, um, about the underlying um, uh, security of it because we were building on the anonymous, uh, um, um, uh, on the um, uh, pseudo-anonymous uh, identifier scheme that was already built into the uh, built into the phones. 
We then realized we could use Bluetooth to do the, um, uh, to do the distance thing. I went back, reported to SAGE, Public Health England uh, um, could not understand it. They couldn't understand the idea of an app. Um, uh, they had always done um, um, uh, contact tracing before, um, which they had a long track record of people with um, um, uh, uh, sexually transmissible diseases and, uh, um, uh, um, and so on, by people manning telephones and people phoning, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, phoning up. They were massively off the pace. Uh, uh, massively off the, pay, uh, or, or off the pace in this regard. They had zero clue about tech and about apps. Um, at this point, I just realized that I've got a massive talk and not the time uh, um, uh, to do it. At this point, a privacy and ethics debate emerged. And um, uh, uh, I had underestimated the fact that, that the entirety of the UK computer science community had gone home and was sitting in their study um, with plenty of time to email me and colleagues <laughs> about, their, um, uh, about their views. It was remarkably unhelpful, <laughs> uh, um, um, simply because they had not people had not collectively understood the context of an emergency. Um, uh, context of an emergency. Um, and I think um, the consequence was around the contact tracing app, there emerged a malformed privacy um, uh, debate, uh, debate, largely dominated by, I would say, the fringe of privacy advocate, uh, the fringe of privacy advocates, um, and um, I, um, uh, I felt, feel now, that we've allowed a particular segment of voices to dominate that, deba uh, 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 the dominate that debate. And I, I can um, demonstrate that now in this room by asking a second question, which is, what proportion of people here, if you've, if you've got the NHS app, on your phone, the, 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 the standard NHS app. Who has the standard NHS? Here we are. OK. Um, uh, which, of course, consists of uh, uh, an entire health record and not a series of anonymous Bluetooth pings. And yet there was a massive fuss about that. Um, I haven't got time to do this. Uh, what I'm just going to say, uh, um, um, uh, uh, I'm going to just say a few quick things, and then I'll tell the rest of the story in, in with questions. The first is, um, uh, um, I, I was trained in how to handle emergencies, uh, and I think that that was massively important. I think the notion that emergencies are digital had, hadn't really dominated. The thing. I mean, I was on, on Sage by accident. Um, but if you look at the whole range of UK emergencies, often the responses that have been ne necessary are digital. And actually, the digital response to COVID is a really interesting thing that's not been properly looked at and studied. Um, uh, um, I think as professionals, we have public responsibilities. Um, and I think there are a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, and I, I'm not sure that, as a professional community, um, uh, uh, the computer science community responded as it should have done in this con um, um, uh, in this context. I think there's a really interesting set of questions. I didn't get to this bit about the ownership. So one of the reasons why there was a delay in the delivery of the app was a tension between the UK's approach and Google and Apple's approach. Google and Apple own the Bluetooth API. They get to decide how we can access it. Um, uh, and essentially, my belief is that their commercial interests 
desire to con control that API dominated over the public health concern. And um, um, it's theirs. They own it. Um, and there's, a, there's an interesting question about our collective dependence upon some of this large commercially owned infrastructure for our public good um, and how we are going to manage, how we're going to manage that. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed, Anthony. I really. an hour story. I, I think an I'm immense sure. provocation for you know, the audience, I'm sure, have got questions. I'm not going to go to mine, but um, we've got time for a couple. So can we start at the back there? I just saw that hand and then one over there. Hi, Thank Joe. Thank, Thank you, Professor Finkelstein. That was, oh, I do have a... <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Place Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Finkelstein. Uh, my name's Kevin McNish from Sopristeria. I actually have just published a book on the ethics of surveillance during the times of emergency, uh, so it's a very interesting talk. I, I hasten to add that the contributors to the book were not on the fringe of privacy debate, as you say. Um, I, I would caution just on one thing when you said you were focused not on the ethics, but on people dying. I would say that being concerned with people dying is one of the core ethical principles that one can worry about. You may just not have been thinking about it as an ethical approach at the time. But I, I was really interested just at the very end of your talk where you brought in the um, Apple Google app. And as I recall from the time, the UK had developed its own app first, which was trialed in the Isle of Wight and had an extremely low take up rate of about 35%. And when the apps were first being talked about, there was a lot in the news about, in order for them to function, we needed a take up of 75, 85% or whatever. And I don't think we ever actually achieved that. So I'd just be interested in your reflections uh, on that, that public yeah, take up. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, uh, 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 sure. So, yeah, I should say that the, the discussions that, um, um, that the security and privacy discussions emerge slightly, uh, slightly later. So what exactly happened was that um, uh, um, the, there was a UK, there was a, a first prototype app. That prototype app, uh, or sort of, you know, version not, you know, in an agile sort of sense, you know, version 0.1, um, uh, uh, built around the centralized architecture. Um, and that was trialed in the Isle. Uh, that was trialed in the Isle of Wight. Um, in fact, I think my take on this is the Isle of Wight trial was, in some ways, a massive success, um, uh, um, despite the fact that there wasn't um, uh, that high take up. It was pretty high take up at that stage. Um, um, at that stage, um, and. Um, the Isle of Wight, with its aging population, was probably one of the poorest choice. I mean, it had been chosen because it was, in some ways, aside from some other features, um, uh, because it was a, um, uh, going to be a challenging target. The, the inverted commas, failure of the Isle of Wight trial, you know, and trials are meant to be mm. trials, they're meant to uh, think, was that um, um, we couldn't get the Bluetooth to work the way that we needed the Bluetooth to work. So in order to use the Bluetooth in the way that it needed to be used, we needed to have access to, um, uh, to functions not provided for in the, a, um, um, a, in the API. And that's under the control of Apple and Google. Concurrently, Apple and Google were developing a wholly decentralized approach. Now, the, in my judgment, the decentralized approach and the centralized approach, there's precious little that divides them in terms of the, the privacy or security they provide. There are different choice 
of how to do, uh, 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 of how to do it. I believe the benefits of the centralized approach is that we could learn and change things really quickly, which is why, I mean, I would have done a distributed architecture. I just know they're impossibly difficult to change and evolve. So you, you do them, you, you know, uh, uh, your first port of call to learn things is something that's really simple. And that was my, um, uh, that was my choice. So. That was the story. Subsequently, it became clear that in order to develop the app, it, we needed the, uh, uh, um, uh, to get to the API. The only choice was, it was force majeure, the only choice was to go with the Google Apple thing. At that point, the same team that had, um, uh, uh, that had been involved in, in or much of the same team um, uh, um, went on to develop um, uh, the app. So the, it, it, uh, um, but the architecture changed at that um, at that point because there was no choice. Thank you. I think we're going to have to wrap up there. Otherwise, we're going to. But if I'm, I'm very sorry, Joe. Did you want to make a comment, maybe? I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I'll make a, a, br a brief comment. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Sir Finkelstein. Um, I'm Joe Butler, ex Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, which is ex as a department, <laughs> uh, and ex resident of the Isle of Wight. But that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the, the, the talk. I, I think it's a brilliant case study for, yeah, for this audience. Yeah. It's a privilege for us to hear it, and I'd it love is. to hear the, uh, the full version <laughs> when there's, there's more time available. I suppose my comment would be, or more of a question to comment on perhaps later in the day, is um, this is a brilliant case study of an emergency situation which brings a lot of action and focus together quickly. But we all know, so for example, this is responding to the pandemic, which was at the top of the UK's risk register, or very near the top of the UK's risk register. We know there'll be another pandemic at some point in the future. We now have yeah, the okay. luxury of time to consider some of these points, and more widely in digital generally, so IoT, critical national infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's an interesting gap between R&D and some of our innovation, and yeah. then this kind of work. So I think it's a really interesting thing to consider lessons yeah. in that space. I'm just gonna make a very brief response, which is, so here's my contention. Um, all, all future emergencies will have a really strong digital component. Uh, it's already become the case. When we did this, um, basically we walked into an empty building. We didn't have accounts, we didn't have infrastructure, mm. we didn't have standards, we didn't have a project management approach. Uh, everything was done from scratch, from the outset. Had we invested, by the by, I was a reviewer of the National Risk Register, had we invested... Um, um, you know, 100K in having, mm. you know, pre-existing uh, 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 cloud, a pre-existing app framework, um, uh, um, um, uh, you know, a, a, a template set of ethics, uh, um, uh, you know, approvals, a structure, all of the basic sort of software engineering infrastru uh, infrastructure would have saved ourselves an enormous amount of time. And that enormous amount of time it's probably, you know, a thousand or two thousand lives. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you very much, Anthony. So, final thanks. Really thought provoking. <laughs>